Well, we're looking at Romans 5.12, and we've talked about the federal headship and the realism, seminalism, viewpoints. This is a verse, and particularly the last clause, because all sinned, that has caused theologians to try to understand exactly the relationship of us to Adam and us to Adam's sin. And so, strictly representative has arisen, usually in the covenant theology context. He was our representative, and the key point is, of course, is that he knew it, that what he did would affect his posterity. Strong emphasis on imputation. Very strong emphasis on imputation. It's not that federal headship denies depravity from our parents, that we are born depraved, but that's not the focus of attention. Realism does not ignore imputation, but focuses more upon the genealogical or biologic, biological union between Adam and his posterity. We were there. Immediate imputation view is just seminal connection. It's a total emphasis on depraved nature. Apparently, at one time at least, John Calvin may have even held to this view. The modern day expunged, however, is Cranfield of the Romans commentary fame. Calvin said all sin because we are all imbued with natural corruption. And for this reason we are wicked and perverse. We are not guilty of Adam's sin. Sin for which we are condemned is our own sin. It's ours. He talks about vitiating made defective in Adam, that our nature is made defective in Adam. We receive it in condition which puts us immediately in transgression. I've been have struggled with this over the years to explain what's going on. You remember I showed you the upside down triangle? It's one of those verses where you build a lot. Let's take a look at this final view that has been put forward by David Turner. I've called it the personal sin view. He didn't really give it a title. Unexplained solidarity view is the best way to describe it. It's what I'd call the fourth acceptable option for the transmission of original sin. Now, he's well aware of the fact that there's a certain danger about his position, but the dissertation is well worth reading. Adam, Christ, and us the Pauline teaching of solidarity in Romans 5, 12 through 21. I've given you, I think, even the library call number in your notes. The basic thrust that he wants to bring out, I think I can probably... put it something like this. He looks at all sinned. and stresses the gnomic aorist or constative aorist because since all sinned and takes it as referring to the personal individual sins of all men. Now notice the which are considered a key statement in the definition which are committed due to an unexplained Solidarity with Adam. That's going to be his strong emphasis. Romans 5, 12 through 21 puts Adam as the originator of sin. So he looks at the gnomic aorist, sees it pointing to personal sins. Summarizing it, as it were, 
summing up the sins of all men, pointing to an irrefutable axiomatic truth. All men sin. All men die because one sinned. All men. He wants to stress the universality of personal sin. John Murray said if Paul meant actual sins of all men, without doubt this expression would have been used. No other would be suitable. He does make Adam the originator of sin, so it resonates with the other views. And it does make Adam the first sinner. That's an irrefutable, brutal fact of history. That Adam was the first sinner. And as a result of that, there was a major impact upon the world and upon his posterity. So at this point, it resonates with the other views. That's why I've called it an acceptable option. He talks about one man sinning, the origin and cause of personal sinning. Adam sinned and introduced death. So all men are now caught up in what he calls the unavoidable nexus of sin and death. That's what he's talking about here. Here's one man, one sin. That constituted his posterity sinners. Use of kathistami is a major aspect of his study. And because of what Adam did, all men, the origin and cause of personal sinning, should actually add and death, are caught up in that unavoidable nexus of sin and death. It's impossible to avoid that. But he's concerned in trying to explain the connection with Adam that in Adam is missing. It's such an important phrase that why is it left out? Can it be legitimately put forward as an ellipsis? If you read through the text, is there sufficient coming up to it for you to automatically add at that point in Adam. See, that phrase is having to be su supplied and that seems to be contra the other views. If this was so important in explaining the solidarity, why is it left out? And for him that's a <coughs> major anomaly. It's a critical point that's unexpressed. Federal headship and realism, of course, understand in Adam is there. He looks at F. Ho, takes it as being causal, he's satisfied with that, does a lengthy analysis of F. Ho, in whom or upon which, taking it as a pretty standard clause. Augustine took it as being in whom, but it does seem to carry the weight of because, since, in as much as. So, what he's proposing is that. personal individual sins committed due to an unexplained but, and I added, but very real because this comes out in his dissertation. You don't have this very real solidarity with Adam. It, it sums up the notes you have. All sin is an omic aorist expressing an irrefutable axiomatic truth. That because of Adam's sin, there's that unavoidable web, sin, death. And that Romans 5.12d, because all sin can unfortunately invert the triangle, which is a phrase I'm using from his 
dissertation creating too much of a structure on a small base. Some things to remember about this personal sin view, also known as unexplained solidarity, nota bene, means note very well. Don't confuse it with men sinning independently of Adam, no connection. And don't conclude that there's a rejection of any solidarity with Adam. This, he takes a whole chapter to deal with to demonstrate that in speaking about unexplained solidarity, he does not mean independently of Adam altogether. That's an important point to remember when defining this. Now, if you read this paragraph here where I've got basic thrust in your notes, Adam's original sin introduced into the world as a hostile power, death, which permeated all men on the fulfilled condition that all sin. That's the nomic errors. <coughs> but let's ask a number of questions of his proposal. And by the way, it's quite a long dissertation. He took an extremely long, quite a number of pages to set, set it. And the reason why is he did a complete thorough analysis of all textual variance and literary structure in relationship to context. He examined thoroughly the F. Ho, Pontes, Hamarton phrase in detail and then drew his conclusion and defended what he recognized could be weaknesses in it. You want an example of how a dissertation should be done? This was one. Major questions. Is this view not open to a charge of Pelagian independence? That is, of the individual sinning independent of Adam. Yes, it is open to the charge as a knee jerk reaction. It happens inevitably. Men read the view and say, ah, semi Pelagian. No, listen. He said, due to an unexplained solidarity with Adam, notwithstanding personal individual sin. So don't go down that track. He's not going down that track. But yes, it is possibly open to the charge if you're not thinking. Is not immediate imputation of Adam's sin being too quickly set aside? Well, that's not, as, not an easy one to answer because one of the things that he stresses very strongly is that it is very difficult to demonstrate imputation of sin in Scripture. If, and yet, I want you to think about this. Don't need to react. Think. We're not discussing imputation of righteousness where I'm reckoned to be what I'm not. If imputation is a divine operation solely in the sphere of the forensic, how can depravity, a matter which concerns the actual moral state of one's human nature, be the object of forensic judgment? It's a good question. Second question. Is not imputation solely concerned with one's legal standing and not with the moral state of one's nature? So that while we may speak of the imputation of sin's guilt, including genuine culpability, we may not speak of the imputation of sin's pollution. It's from an older book, Hutchinson, which he cites, and it's two good questions. And it is correct to say, are you setting imputation aside too quickly? 
he's setting aside the imputation of sin as pollution. The guilt of Adam's sin is one thing. The actuality of Adam's sin is another. So maybe you can diagram it like this. It's a divine operation operating in the forensic sphere, dealing with legal standing, not dealing with the moral state of man's nature. Pollution is the moral state of nature. It's a very real condition. This is what man is inherently. So therefore, you may speak of the imputation of sin's guilt and not of sin's pollution. Adam's act constituted all men sinners so that all generations are born sinful. Okay, a couple of hands up here and I figured there would be. I wonder real quick is uh, how we feel about uh, having, let's see what, what's divided is uh, guilt and corruption which is a, a good distinction. What would we say if uh, we said the uh, Corruption was a seminal uh, passed on thing, and the guilt and what would was we say a uh, corruption was a seminal passed on thing, and the and guilt the, and the guilt would be a uh, a federal headship issue of uh, imputation. Yeah, in actual fact, it's probably where we're going to end up. I, I'm just going to call natural headship though, and you've got a page I handed out where I gave you that four point four bullet points on natural headship. We can have imputed to us the guilt of Adam's <coughs> transaction. But in the absence of clear statements of the imputation of sin, and trying to stay true to the biblical data, he has Push to the side. It's not that he's pushed aside participation or representation. He sees the passage and elsewhere not contributing to a full understanding of the solidarity. And out of a desire not to go too far with the one verse, he stops and says, There's a solidarity. That's obvious. One man sinned, all sinned. One man died, all died. But it's, there's an inherent nature that is corrupt. So, I, sin operating, I mean, imputation operating in a forensic sphere can't declare me to be sinful because I'm not. It's not declaring me to be sinful because I am. It's not the exact parallel to imputation of righteousness. What then is the basis of men's status, guilty and depraved? Adam's sin or not? Is the absence of in Adam a vital point? To him it is. A very vital point that prevents you from drawing a, from drawing a conclusion satisfyingly enough from the limited data. One man asked the question, I took a copy of it from his dissertation, page 277. This is good. This is a guy called Johnson writing on Roman size, S. Lewis Johnson. If inherent depravity is a punishment and it is hardly possible to argue otherwise, then guilt must have preceded it. Okay. What then could the guilt be other than the guilt of Adam's first sin? That's page 311 of S. Lewis Johnson's article on the biblical crux interpretum of Romans 5. If inherent depravity is punishment and it's hardly possible to argue otherwise, then guilt must have preceded it. 
What then could the guilt be other than the guilt of Adam's first sin? But here's Turner's response. This question is logically compelling. But it is a question which is never answered. You could actually say that inherent depravity is a consequence of Adam's sin, but not necessarily a punishment for it. At any rate, the answer to the question lies outside the scope, perhaps, of these verses. So what's the connection between Adam and men? What's the line of analogy between the relation of men to Christ and men to Adam? Paul does not give an answer in the sense that we ask the questions. He's not presenting a theory. Now catch this. The emphasis that Dave Turner makes as he looks at the nomic aorist, as he looks at the absence of a critical point that's left unexpressed, as he considers that imputation is not that clearly presented, imputation of sin, as he looks at the fact that men do sin independently of Adam and are under this sentence of death as he does recognize natural headship and he does recognize the unavoidable sin and death nexus and he does see an irrefutable axiomatic truth being expressed when he looks at all of that he says Paul is not presenting a theory but appealing to acknowledged facts Adam's act was the beginning of sin, understood. Owing to that act, Adam died, understood. And all died, understood, because all sinned. How? In Adam, as a rep, as biological union, on the fulfilled condition that in as much as sense slips over to the nomic aorist. Fact is, men sin, men die. Can you comment on 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, which does contain the phrase, in Adam, all died? And if you, if you sort of take those two passages together with Paul and theology, okay, sin spread because all died. And there is the anatomy in that one passage. Isn't that sort of strike yeah, the... Read the full verse. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Yeah, you still come back to this first. I mean, explain the because all sin. In Adam would be what realism or federal headship. So it would be a weak point in personal sin, unexplained solidarity view that he's making the in Adam, but, but he's got a point. The in Adam missing in Romans 5:12 is a critically critical point unexpressed that is left until First Corinthians. Yeah, John. It seems then the real issue is. Paul's arguing, saying, look, your nature is passed from Adam and it's corrupted. And whether you sin like Adam did or you sin in your own ways, you nevertheless stand condemned before God. Right. And so it becomes a new point, doesn't it, in a sense? Yes, it does. But he's concerned. And standing in defense of him at this point, he's deeply concerned not to invest one verse with such a large amount of information with not all other verses elsewhere being brought into play. Are you talking about Turner or Paul? Turner. Very concerned that a tremendous amount of information has been put down upon this one phrase. And we come up with federal this and realism that and immediate imputation this and immediate imputation that. And so you recognize that Got good men of equal mental power have looked at Romans 5.12 D and have struggled to explain. And there, there are obviously other factors coming in. 
Yes, sir. Um, and think about Turner's view and then that little phrase, all sin. Um, it seems like what he's saying is that that being a gnomic is a result of death spread. But, I mean, in, in my translation, it's a cause. Because all spread, that's why I, I was sort of surprised that he wants it to be translated because. He took it as because, since, in as much as all three. It's still the same thing. It's on, because of the fulfilled condition. On the basis of the fulfilled condition. Since all sinned. In fact, there are a number of options to translate that. On the fulfilled condition, that was since all sinned. Or upon the basis of which all sinned. Or with a view to which all sinned. The best one seems to be the first one. He looked at complexitive and historical errors as well and rejected them. His point is that there's no modus operandi being explained in the context. And that's a good point. He sees the strong use of cathostami as an important point. Official recognition of a previous condition. The answer of solidarity is not explained. That's <coughs> that's his big gripe, actually. But he listen to this strong conclusion. There is no support here for the doctrine of the imputation of Adam's first sin, whether, conce whether conceived representatively or realistically. That's a pretty strong conclusion. Adam is put forward as the originator and the first sinner and in some unspecified way and if you turn over the page that I gave you you'll see on the other side I gave a summary of solidarity in Adam that I extracted from his different chapters to show something of the difference under the unexplained solidarity on that first line in some unspecified way resulted in all men being sinners with because all sin referring to the personal sins of all men then I noted irrefutable truth and not a theory of solidarity federalism the sin of Adam was the sin of a representative realism the sin of Adam was the sin of human nature Immediate imputation, the sin of Adam is reckoned as the sin of all through the medium of in inherited depravity. So the emphasis is on that inherited corruption. These are different enough. Not startlingly distinctive, but different enough to say, all right, I guess there's quite a debate going on here. His people are rendered sinners. Christ's people are rendered righteous. At least there is the recognition. That's why we call it acceptable. Of one man, one sin died. All men, all sinned, died. There is solidarity. I think I put this paragraph on the bottom of the page because points out something else even as he recognizes that the emphasis is on two men and their acts upon their people you have a final paragraph there that says acknowledges that the view of 512 will determine verses 13 and 14 and this is interesting if you are committed to an Adamic sin view then verses 14, 13 and 14 is an argument that Adam's sin causes the death of all men, even those whose sins were not charged against them like Adam's. But if convinced that personal sins are in view, then verses 13 and 14 is an explanation that even in the absence of the law, personal sin still merits death. And he actually states in his dissertation that to some extent, 
the force of F ho and of verses 13 and 14, how they stand, how they're to be understood, is determined by other factors leading up to that final clause. Oh, fine. Federal headship, realism, immediate imputational, unexplained solidarity. I prefer that to personal sin view because the statement personal sin triggers Pelagian. Echoes of Pelagianism here. And we are sort of trained to respond to that. That is a negative chime. Yeah, correctly so of its error but he's by the way should, should say this lest you think in otherwise he would never have been allowed to submit a dissertation at Grace Seminary that would be considered error it would have been flung back he had Dr. Smith I believe on his committee who would never have allowed that you see I'll tell you who's on his committee Smith, Zemeck and John Sproul now John Sproul's name may mean nothing to you any of you guys heard of him? John Sproul former president at Capitol Seminary Dean for a long time at Southeastern Bible College, prof for many years at Grace. If this had smacked in the slightest of error, Sproul would never have put his signature on it. So this was carefully thought out. I hope I've done it justice. I'm attracted to it, but not sold. I think we have to talk in terms of a relationship to Adam's sin. You can't get away from that. So, okay, no theory. Presenting a fact, acknowledge facts, drawing a conclusion is a little hard. So where do we go from here? Sure, would you have an important question? Well, I want to ask your opinion uh, that that verse 19 in Romans 5 had any bearing to this discussion. The first part of it, it reads, uh, For as many, excuse me, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Yeah, and deals with Kathy Samey. That's right. All men are constituted sinners. So they, from that point on, all men are depraved. Is that, uh, how does that, uh, First, uh, bear upon his arguments. Is that, um... it, it doesn't disturb his argument because he has recognized natural headship and he has recognized that Adam's sin in some unspecified way this doesn't give enough in some unspecified way made all men sinners okay. so the mechanical theory the mechanics of it the theory of that is not here. And he sees the parallel with the righteousness of Christ being so much more than that the parallel actually is not to be, doesn't have to be equal in every respect. Jonathan. Two questions. So are you saying that, that the, the title personal sin view is, is a, is a, uh, Synonym for unexplained solidarity? Yes. Okay, even though it's, it can be understood wrong. And then, secondly, are you saying that unexplained solidarity is attempting to say no more than the text would say? And is that why they're... Is that, yes. Is that, is that, is that, is that, He's using personal sin view as an explanation of Pont Pontes Hamarton of that all sinned individual acts of men but he's acknowledging a solidarity with Adam so that's exactly right he's staying with the parameters of the text it, it hasn't gone far enough so he doesn't want to take another step 
Stick this in front of you, maybe this will help. Somebody had a hand up? So he, yes, ma'am. Is he saying then that um, the imputation in some sense is there? Death is caused by personal sin, or death is caused by Adam's sin? Death is caused by Adam's sin, and all men being sinners is caused by Adam's sin. But each, each man inevitably sins, not just because of depravity, but because it is an acknowledged, irrefutable fact, he will sin. How does he know then that age-old question of accountability and things like that? Stuck me on that one. I don't recall what he said. Pardon? Not even sure that he covered that. That's a question for all the views. Accountability. Yeah. Dr. Craig, is it part of this dilemma them trying to take the imputation of Christ's righteousness to look to the believer and, and making such a strong parallel to Adam's no, sin? No, actually it's the other way around. Or, but it seems like they're trying to make both exactly equal along the way. No, that, that's his complaint about the other view. They try to keep the parallel too close. I mean, the parallel doesn't have to be that close because there's so much more involved with Christ and his own. But I'm saying that seems to be the root problem in a lot of this. Yeah, it's, it's because they, I mean, he acknowledges the fact that this passage is dealing with two men and two, two peoples, they impact. Yeah, and in so doing, exceptions along the way showing that it's not equal in that sense. Yeah, and he's, he's acknowledged that. Actually, I thought I'd brought that out. He clearly acknowledges two men, two descendants, or two bodies that they impact. Here it is. In verses 20 through 21, Paul explains that the law came in to magnify sin. However, the magnification of sin was only to more abundantly magnify God's grace, which is one of the three so much mores. Adam's sin rendered his people sinners, but Christ's redemption rendered his people righteous. The law magnified sin's grim reign in death, but God's final purpose for his people is the righteous reign of grace. The goal of this reign is eternal life. All of this is possible through redemption. So he ends up with a strong emphasis on Christ and his own. Because the point brought up last week, which was pretty good, is, you know, they even break it down further in that righteousness doesn't pass on to the next generation. It starts all over again. Right. But depravity does. Exactly. <coughs> but, but Christ impacts his own. The basis, the, the basis for Turner's view is, since I can't see imputation thoroughly enough substantiated on the pages of Scripture, not imputation of righteousness, but of sin, which is operating in the realm of the forensic, remember, not dealing with my actual condition. Since I can't find that use, I think I better stop and leave it as an unexplained solidarity. If I could just defend the federal view for a second. You can. Um, because Christ, not only are we declared righteous, but our nature is affected by Christ's action as well. I'm becoming sanctified and I will be glorified with my nature. So it's, it's not my legal right. standing and it's my nature which parallels perfectly with Adam. I'm a sinner and I'm morally corrupt. Yeah. I mean, the parallel is so strong. In verse 18, he even <clears throat> says, in one man's righteous act, all are justified. He's not so, I mean, we wouldn't be yeah, comfortable and, saying and that. Realism would acknowledge that. So federal headship and realism would acknowledge that. There's no problem with that. That's, that's clearly accepted. And as a matter of fact, he accepts that too. So it's 
I'm stopping short of going any further because I don't have enough data to take it any further. This is dealing with these two men and their two acts, one of disobedience, one of obedience, affecting two groups of people, one affecting everybody, one affecting a contextually adjusted all, the many. Okay, That's recognized. Now, when I go to 12D and try to deal with the because all sinned, I start to run in, into the swamp of what sort of solidarity is this? Just imputation? Just realism? Mixture of both? So let me just take you through these charts here and put up another chart that will maybe help. Here we are. Solidarity view splits into two. Seminalism, federalism. Federalism, immediate direct imputation. Seminalism, immediate indirect imputation. That's the chart as it stands in Wayne Ouster's book. But you can add. Seminalism also can deal with participation. It's not imitation or repetition or imputation of Adam's sin that counts, but participation in it with the corrupt nature and guilt and condemnation flowing therefrom. That would be one explanation. Or you can go this way. You can add one more element. Seminalism, unexplained solidarity, what we've been talking about. So you can add to the chart substantially. And, and the reason why it doesn't have unexplained solidarity or participation is because it only comes out in Turner's thesis and he hadn't had it yet when he did the charts. So let's put this up. Here's the diagram I left space for. Let's start wide. I gave you the details where to find it. It's from Charles Ryrie. Don't get bent out of shape. A comparison of how inherited and imputed sin are transmitted. Inherited sin, Adam, Cain, Enoch, Erad, Seth, Enosh, Ken, and me. Comes down the line. Imputed sin, Adam, direct to each. But I wonder if it isn't better to, to change a word on the diagram and say imputed guilt. Not the sin. You didn't sin the same way as Adam did. But you've been declared guilty of his. So it's a kind of a what you called a mixture of federal headship and realism. Perhaps that's the better term to use. Imputed guilt. It still doesn't explain the solidarity, but it's satisfying enough to cover all the data. Imputed sin would be to each person, let's make an imputed guilt to each person. But each person also stands in a biological, genealogical relation with Adam anyway, or natural headship position. So any good explanation should recognize the modus operandi is not the focus, that the ultimate concrete results of the two antithetical acts of the two men is Paul's focus, and thirdly, that the parallel between Adam and Christ and their posterity should not be pressed too far, forcing an exact parallel, should underscore exact. Be better voiced, perhaps, did we not fall through no fault of our own? Did we not rise through no merit of our own? It's Adam's fault. I'm dead. It's Christ's act. I'm alive. Are we sinners by imputation or by participation in the nature changed by one action? Well, here's Turner's response, page 256. to 76. Some
some unspecified way would be the answer. If sin and death are so inextricably linked, then what is the effect of the fall of man, sin entering, death passing, corrupting on creation? We've answered that question already. We can move on. If you choose federal headship, you must nevertheless explain corrupted sin. If you choose realism, you must be willing to acknowledge some form of headship by Adam. Anyway, it doesn't have to be a covenant theology one. If you choose unexplained solidarity, be prepared to acknowledge weaknesses that seem to bypass imputation of guilt from Adam, which would be the would be necessary. If you choose immediate imputation view, still be prepared to acknowledge some form of headship or representation. So, your choice. Four acceptable options. I'm, I'm, I've, we were taught realism. I've accepted realism. I'm attracted to unexplained solidarity. I recognize something of imputation of guilt. When they make statements like they did on the shoot, they freaking it out. Yeah. Solidarity now. Do you have a resource at all that can give us the basics, the verses, or whatever they're, they're uh, basing their statements on? You know, it's, it's interesting. I'm glad you asked that. Because it's all based upon Romans 5.12. Is it all just on that one verse? Or is this that one verse with one? the consideration of the two men and the two acts and the two consequences that flow out of exactly. the rest of the chapter. Okay. Yeah. And that's what Turner's reacting to. Built this whole structure on one phrase. However, please remember that Pelagianism is not involved in any of the options acceptable options, or semi-Pelagianism, or an Arminianism. All the men that teach, good men that teach federal headship, realism, immediate imputation, unexplained solidarity, are all publicly Calvinist. With one exception. The only one that embraces a bit more of unbiblical than the others, a bit more, I mean, a big slice more, is the covenant theologian. So there's a, he has a bigger question over his understanding of the covenants. But otherwise we walk the same page so far as election and God's sovereignty and lordship of Christ, sinfulness of men, inability to move towards God. All those things are the same. So we, we're actually resting with explanation of solidarity. And so long as you keep that solidarity in place, you won't slip into Pelagianism. Okay. Uh, verse uh, 13, 14, right after 12, seems to be worthy of some more discussion like Tucker's uh, position. <clears throat> that the last thing it said in 12, for all, that all have sinned, and then it goes right in for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Is it not safe to say then if it's safe that sin is not imputed when there is no law, that sin is imputed when there is law? It's charged to your account. And then, uh, and then nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses. So on the one hand, even when sin wasn't imputed, nevertheless death reigned. So that could be corruption. The emphasis, emphasis of verses 13 and 14 is to answer the question, what about the time where there was no law given? Right. How can we call those men sinful? Because we can speak clearly to sinfulness if, if a man breaks the law and has that charge to his account. It's not a forensic imputation, though it's a real reckoning to him. You have violated a law. You have been disobedient. You have broken the standard. That was clearly revealed. What about these men? That was part of the two questions that came up on that email that I talked about? What about when there was no law? 
when Moses hadn't come. There's hundreds of years there. Well, the reality is those men were sinners and sinning in sinful acts. And the reason is they died. That's the emphasis. Death, death, verse 13, I'm sorry. Yeah, death reigned. Yeah, I said imputation is not a forensic. It's, it's, a, it's a valid charge of you have broken a law. It's count reckon so you, you have to even look at the semantic range of impute. Yeah. Dr. Craig, then we must stop. Are there any verses that intimate that Christ's death on the cross in any way pays for the sin of Adam? When you, when you listen to the, 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 the different verses talking about the imputation of righteousness, it's always being applied to that individual, not that individual plus. No, it's, it's, individual, it's all those who are his. Yeah, we'll pick up on that under the atonement and the work of Christ. We'll keep that for that time. It's just go over these quickly. said I wanted to bring it to a close with biblical instances of restrained depravity. For we're dealing with men that are depraved in Adam. And you have a number of things. Built-in conscience... Moralist and the religionist have nothing to offer in litigation, but nevertheless they have some moral values and some religious values that have apparently have made them appear to be in their time from human perspective good. Righteousness is filthy rags. There were deeds that we would call good. They have no value. Good Samaritan, tenable and capable of being seen in life. A rich young ruler who thought he had kept the whole law that had apparently restrained him, except it couldn't restrain his pride. Tax collectors who love their own kind, they may be bad people, but a, a thoroughly bad person from one perspective doesn't mean that he's thoroughly bad to his family. Father not giving a deliberately hurtful gift to his son, one who gives up life for his friends, shown great love. Books are opened and the deeds are judged, with the implication not taken far enough that some sort of gradation occurs. Yes, sir. What's your first name again? Will. Will. What, what does it mean, Good Samaritan, tenable and capable of being seen in life? Well, the story of the Good Samaritan would be absolutely meaningless if it wasn't something that could be seen. That's the impact of stories like that. This type of person is tenable. You, you could actually see somebody stop and help another. That, and that does happen in life. So you can have somebody who's acting like a good Samaritan, but he's, he's a depraved man. Because somewhere along the way, somehow teaching impacted his heart and mind that it's not bad to do good things to people. But it stays on the horizontal level. And I'm sure we could think of others if we took the time. there are believers who do good conduct but even to some extent unbelievers could do this too to give a cup of water in my name somebody can give a cup of water to a thirsty person without doing it in the name of Christ a servant girl who went to Naaman Melchizedek and Abraham certainly a good conduct between them which would maybe be strictly our believers of Joseph in Potiphar's house and in prison. His good deeds, his good morals and his good standards are because of the changed nature that he had. The Hall of Famers, not because of their philanthropy, because of their faith. God fearers like Cornelius, who acted well. These are big this is good conduct that God is pleased with, but it emanates from a saved heart. Here's the defining difference. And that's what we deal with under sanctification. For the unsaved, it's the fruit of the flesh. Earthly, natural, demonic wisdom, by nature a child of wrath, etc. You can pile that up. For the saved, it's the fruit of the spirit. Good works ordained beforehand. Pure, peaceable, gentle wisdom. No longer by nature a child of wrath, etc. Defining difference. 
They can do good deeds, but it doesn't change the unsaved state. They do do good deeds in the name of Christ and in honor, in the honor of the name of God. Or they can do bad deeds because they act sometimes like the unsaved. And that takes us into the doctrine of salvation. This is what we're going to be looking at. Biblical view of man. Original man, original image, able not to sin. This is the level to look at. Able not to sin, genuinely free, but not a perfected freedom. We've dealt with fallen man, so now he's not able not to sin. It's passed down. Perverted image, in slavery, outside of Christ, heading for hell. In Christ, because of regeneration, death of the old man, he's now a new man in Christ Jesus, renewed image or renewal of the image taking place. Able not to sin. Notice the change. Able not to sin. Not able not to sin. Able not to sin. Back, back to being genuinely free, but freedom can be abused. First stage of new life. To glorification. In Christ, now the glorified man, body like unto his own, perfectly and totally free of sin. Not able to sin. Major change. This is substantially more than that. Permanent stage of new life. Here you'd go on to heaven, new heavens and new earth. And basically that's a pictorial summary. This is what we've dealt with. This is where we're going. This unfortunately will be a closing minor emphasis. Don't have time to deal with it. This is where we'll be spending our, spending, spending our time.